At the bottom of Grand Street, underneath the St. John Cathedral, the Park Inn is an unstoppable monument of a bar. Two blocks away, one of its closest competitors is now a hole in the ground. The 619 Bar and Grill didn't survive the last recession. A lot of bars didn't. Dozens and dozens a year bars open and close, change ownership, buildings close up, whatever, and we survive. The South Hills' oldest bar has weathered a lot of economic downturns, including the Great Depression. This is a bar with a history that has never been properly told. Until now. My favorite thing about the Park Inn, the people that come here. Total mix of people. Older people, younger people, and people in between. Uh, working class, upper class. Judges, lawyers. Average, working for their hard dollar. Community comes here. The 40s up until the uh, early 60s, it was probably the only bar on the south side of town. Though it ranks as one of the top five oldest bars in the area, its biggest accomplishment may come from its restaurant side. In the last century, there have been a handful of establishments that have claimed the mantle of Spokane's oldest restaurant. The last three to do so, the Rockaway, the Davenport, and the Silver Grill, arguably the three most elegant restaurants of 20th century Spokane, had rich, well-documented histories. The Park Inn has never been considered elegant. It's never been documented by historians, and most of its history has been correctly or incorrectly passed down through workers and customers. The owners of the Park Inn have never advertised it as Spokane's oldest restaurant. Never, never even thought that that might be the case. But evidence exists on the third floor of the downtown library in the 1932 city directory. There are 209 restaurants listed that year. 208 of them have since closed down, leaving only Freeman's Park Inn, as it was originally known. Since opening in 1932, it's been in continuous operation in the same location it started, which would make it possibly the oldest restaurant in the eastern half of the state. No one knows who Freeman was or why he named his restaurant the Park Inn. It may have been parking related. A 1941 newspaper ad claims, it's a fact, there's always parking space at the Park Inn. More likely it was in reference to Manitou Park, which was just a few stops away by streetcar. For years it was thought that the original structure of the bar began as a shell service station. When I first started working here, there were a couple concrete pads out there where the original gas pumps used to be. And in fact, there was a service station on the property from 1916 until 1931. However, a recently unearthed picture from 1930 shows a barely visible service station next door to what is now the bar. The original structure of the Park Inn was actually built by the Monroe Street Lumber Company, which sold fuel and lumber and had three buildings on the property. The building on the right was demolished over 40 years ago to make room for the parking lot. And though the other two buildings are now joined, they spent three and a half decades as separate businesses, separated by an alleyway, with the Park Inn operating out of the small building on the left. Though customers have always referred to it as the PI, there have been six total variations of the name Park Inn. In 1936, Freeman was dropped from the title, and it became the Park Inn Restaurant. In 1954, it was the Park Inn Cafe. And for a year, it was Ralph's Park Inn Cafe. At that time, it was a cafe and ice cream parlor, and they converted the back half of it into a tavern. It remained the Park Inn Tavern from the mid-50s to the early 80s, when the liquor board insisted that tavern be dropped from the title. In its first decade, the Park Inn was often targeted by burglars, who broke in to steal nickels from its many pinball machines. The earliest known owner, Charles F. Connell, died in 1976, but his daughter, now 81, remembers the Park Inn from the early 40s when it sold burgers and fries and had a drive through window, which was likely right here. For two decades, the structure next door housed everything from a law office to a meat market. For a year, it was known as Ivan's Dining Restaurant. In 1957, a World War II veteran named Dick Schultz turned the property into the Pizza Plaza. He claimed he was the first to bring pizza to Spokane. He was from New York City. And at the time, it had been an appliance store. And after the appliance store closed, he moved in his pizza parlor. In the late 1950s, the Park Inn Tavern became a hangout for the female nursing students living in the dormitories next door. This was their bar. It was walking distance. We were cheap. They could get something to eat, and they could sit there and talk about what, you know, what they had been learning. This was, this was the girls' commons. 
Around dinner time, only nurses were allowed in the building. Later in the evening, the doors would open up for the men. Eight o'clock at night, we'd open up the door and the guys would come roaring in. Nurses have to deal with naked men all day long. And here's an opportunity to work with something that actually functions. You had women from the age of 19 to 25 getting a good paying job. This was prime pickets. Guys that got in here, this was the best selection they could get. To a certain extent, the park inn functions as a museum. Some of the items in the building haven't moved in over half a century. Others can't be moved. You couldn't move it. It's got to weigh a ton. The coal hopper in the basement has been around for almost 80 years and isn't going anywhere soon. You'd have to cut it up with torches or something. I don't think anybody wants to do that. Though occasionally replaced by the Budweiser Corporation, the Budweiser horses, in one form or another, have been in place since the 1970s. The pizza oven has been in use for 50 years. Then there are the airplanes that hang above the front entrance. 1950, maybe a little before then, a guy named Neil Warner was a customer here. He got a leg taken off during World War II, and he got into a hobby of building airplanes. He got into a point where he was a little behind on his bills, and he gave the owner some of the airplanes, the last one being the largest plane, which is an old B-29. It only took one flight, broke a wing off, he put the wing back on, they brought it down here, they hung it up, and it's been there ever since. In a photograph overlooking the bar he once owned is legendary Gordy Olson, who bought the park in in 1963. Gordy was a scary person to look at. He looked like a person that could take you apart in a matter of minutes, but at the same time, he had a heart of gold. He was sweet as could be, especially to the ladies. Back when he was smoking the bar, he had this thing where he had cigarettes behind the bar, and someone would order a pack of you know, Marlboro Reds, and he would throw them behind his back and smack you in the chest with them across the bar. Gordy enlisted in the Navy at 17 years old during World War II. Spent almost the whole time over in the Asian theater uh, fighting the Japanese. His job was basically taking apart Japanese aircraft and finding out what kind of technical advancements they made over our own aircraft. Ironically, the cause of Gordy's death would be an inexperienced pilot unfamiliar with the workings of his own aircraft. They were actually on a fishing trip up in uh, Rivers Inlet up in Canada. And once a year, he'd grab a handful of guys from the bar, and then they'd take a, a small plane out into the backwoods, and they'd fish for salmon. On Monday, July 2nd, 1984, Gordy and seven of his friends, two of them local Spokane bar owners, boarded a flight to Vancouver on their way back home. During takeoff, the small twin-engine plane reached 100 feet of altitude then abruptly nosedived into the tarmac. Darren was his demise because they caught, I don't know, several hundreds of pounds of salmon. The plane crashed and killed everybody on board. It was, it was, it had too much salmon. More than anyone else, Gordy Olson shaped the park in into what it is today. He bought the pizza plaza next door, recipes and all, from Dick Schultz, and combined the two structures in the mid 60s. Since then, pizza has become the signature food item of the Park Inn. We still use the original sauce recipe that Dick Schultz developed in 1953. We still cook it the same way he cooked it back 50 years ago. In the decades Gordy Olson owned the bar, especially the 1970s, it was a much more volatile place. It was a rough and tumble bar back then. You know, I know a lot of people that every time they'd show up on a Saturday night, they were gonna get, drink too much and they were gonna get in a fight. Gordy had a short temper and little tolerance for fighting in his bar. We had an incident in here where he picked up a customer sitting on a stool, the stool and all, walked him out the back door and threw him in the back parking lot. Ron Weber started working here almost 35 years ago. Gordy, I think, taught him a lot about the business and how to run it. And I think Ron was very fond of Gordy. Ron is the ideal manager. He started managing the bar in 1984 after Gordy's death although he sometimes took a back seat when new ownership came in. We were probably the least successful in the mid to late 80s. There was a different management that was in here that just didn't understand what the PI was all about. There was decline in the carpeting. Basically, it was getting shabby. The existing owner wasn't doing so well financially with it. Unhappy with the direction the bar was headed, in 1993, 
Ron, Greg, and three of their golfing buddies acquired the Park Inn and have owned it ever since. One of the owners, Pat Powers, passed on recently. It was just a group of guys that really enjoyed the place and wanted to keep it going in a manner that was to not screw up our clubhouse. The Park Inn is often described as a neighborhood bar, which might seem strange, considering that it is surrounded by hospital buildings. It serves an important purpose for the hospital, for people to be able to get something to eat, maybe have a libation or two, and relax. Next to the hospital are apartment buildings, filled with younger residents, who often treat the Park Inn as a clubhouse during nighttime hours. People that just live in the neighborhood, there's a lot of apartments nearby, and you're close to home, like it's just kind of like the local hangout. During the daytime, the older generation takes over. This is a bar that patrons keep coming back to because it stays the same. It's rarely overcrowded. It stays open till 2 a.m., not 1.45. There's always popcorn. You don't get overcharged for drinks. And more importantly, on any given night, you're going to find either Mike Schaefer or Chris Mills working the bar. The number one reason I come here is for Chris. He, he's just a high energy guy. You couldn't slow him down if you wanted to. He is crazy most of the time. Chris looks like he drank 600 cups of coffee and can't come down from it. I'm ADD and they call it ADD whatever, but I can't sit in one place and just, I can't do that. Um, I gotta be hands on, on my feet moving around. You know, I try to be a likable guy as much as I can, but I'm also kind of an asshole. Chris is high energy and maximum sexuality. Mike is a little bit more reserved, I would say. Uh, he's very easygoing, just extremely easygoing, very friendly. Uh, I don't think anybody in here would say a, a bad word about Mike. All I remember is Hawaiian t-shirt with uh, palm trees on it, dragging me out of the bar with the rolly chair. He said, it's closing time, and uh, it wasn't in my mind, it wasn't time. Mike actually really cares and understands about people. No matter what, he's happy to see you. And that's, I guess that's my style, is it? Uh, just relax. Relax, I'll take care of you and you'll have a good time. It's a great bar. I come down here because everybody brightens my day and it beats the hell out of staying at home. It's a one of a kind, as you've found out. The Park Inn isn't listed on the historical registry. Bing Crosby didn't grow up here, and it's never been visited by a sitting president. But for over 80 years, it has served a more important function. Anybody that needs a living room with some family in it, that's what it is. It's, uh, it's home. For a, uh, a great deal of people, it's home. After hours, am I good to show you smoking? Doesn't matter. Please do. <laughs> yeah, I think it's almost dead. You f***ing filming for 45 minutes with me smoking last night. With a fake drink. And why are people walking in the front door too for 45 minutes? I want to talk about how jealous you are of this lemon butter. Gee, nice, man. Yeah. Well, like this. Honestly, it's spoken. Put your, your shoulder like, like No, right we don't there. need that, right. do we? Because this ain't fucking hitting radio, right? Nah, that's cool, it's man. Gonna hit the he knows what so he's So we can doing. get two mug shots of one Celtic person. No, this is live video, dude. Oh, it is? 